Welcome everyone. We're on. All right. Doing a Q&A today. Been reading chat and not answering questions specifically, so I had some to talk about. We're going to start with uh, Zenataka Do... I know my Zenataka I is an I, but Deodorai. I don't know how to say it anymore, but <clears throat> it's a good id that is known to be aggressive. And the statement is, I was doing some research and found it's actually a misconception that Zenataka Drodori is aggressive species. This is due to similar size males and breeding ratio. I mean, that's the internet, right? It's all out of opinion. So like, my opinion is, kept them for a few years, I found them to be pretty aggressive, right? You could also take that same statement, replace the Goodyear with humans. Spe aggressive species is due to the similar size males and the breeding ratio. Put a hundred guys in the same room and there's only a couple of females, they get more aggressive. Uh, but in general, everyone's got a different tolerance level of aggressiveness. And, you know, I've had guppies that will attack angelfish where they're abnormal, very aggressive. Same thing happens in dogs. You can have a dog that's hyper aggressive, even though its siblings aren't aggressive at all. You know, even male, female doesn't really matter there. Um, so when you're researching a fish like that on the internet, especially one like that, not a lot of people have kept it in proportion to like most standard like box store fish. And so, um, you know, there's going to be research papers that come up and there's going to be uh, anecdotal experience, like what I gave is my experience with that fish. And then there's going to be um, just general popular opinion of like, I kept a different one, like I kept uh, tower eye and it was aggressive. So therefore this goody, it is aggressive. Uh, and that's what you got to sort through there. And I would say that, you know, the takeaway I have from that statement is I wouldn't go around correcting others that research that you've done means that it's a misconception because like for me, yes, I've, I've researched them a lot myself and I've, I've read quite a bit about it, but I've also kept them. And in my experience, they are more aggressive. Now, I think the much bigger conversation to have is more aggressive compared to what? Compared to, you know, uh, a bear guarding its, its cubs or to a, you know, a guppy that's this big, it's a fry, right? And so it's all on a spectrum and it's really hard to measure. And yes, does male and female ratio play into that? Sure. Does water temperature play into that? Yes. Does environmental factors like um, are there plants? Are there hiding spaces? Is the tank huge? Is the tank small? All of those play a factor. Um, you know, temperature is a big one, and you see that a lot in angelfish. If, while keeping them at 78, they're always at breeding temperature, so they tend to fight more. They tend to be more aggressive, more territorial. You keep them down at like 72 or so, it's not in that higher breeding zone. And so you see males, they don't spar nearly as much. They're not trying to court the females as much. They're kind of just on, I'm going to sit here and look good. I'm going to eat mode. And I mean, that's, that's the mode I'm always in, by the way, is I, as I'm going to look good. I'm going to eat. That's my mode. So I stay at about 72 degrees. Winter, summer, doesn't matter. You know, 72 is a sweet spot. Um, but yeah, it's all anecdotal experience on the internet. We're all sharing what we thought, you know. And someone, like with Goodyear's in general, if you keep goodyids with something like mollies and guppies and sword tails and platies, right? They're going to look aggressive. But a lot of what people do with goodyids is they actually keep them with African cichlids. Then they're not very aggressive at all. you got a live bear that can hold its own with all these African cichlids or Central and South American cichlids, and they look like they're non-aggressive. So it really depends um, on the setup and the person evaluating it. So... Yeah, the internet is full of opinions and research. I, I put that in quotes because even when there's a scientific paper and there's lots of them on, especially things like that that are going endangered and extinct, um, there's still observations by a scientist. Yeah, they might get peer reviewed, but it's still an observation. And a lot of times when you read the study, it's not like, okay, we kept this goodyid and 72 other tropical fish species at this temperature in the same size tanks and then had a measurement of what was more aggressive. It's more of, 
I, yeah, they seem to be nipping at each other. They seem to be doing things. And that's more uh, environmental and, and outliers and user experience type stuff there. And so, um, yeah, I always, I always want to try and correct what I think is an injustice. And that is, you know, stating something that is very opinion based as fact. And so even my own anecdotal experiences, yes, I've kept them. I've sold them. I've interacted with lots of customers. And in general, they are more aggressive in my finding but it's all based on my perception of what aggression is and the fish we're trying to keep with them and things like that. And so I try to correct myself as often as I can of when I make a statement and I go, wait, that's not, don't take that as like a a statement of truth. Take that as a statement of opinion from me. And, uh, you know, so yeah, moving on. I'm sure a lot of questions have come in now, I hope. So I've got more things to Uh, talk about. I wasn't necessarily trying to dwell on that one, but it allows me time to get more questions and keep the stream flowing. So I want to make sure you don't feel like I've necessarily singled you out, Spencer, or more singling out that topic because it was a good one to talk about. So okie dokie. I'm on part three of Rena's question here. Uh, She's looking at some baby goldfish or at least some one-inch goldfish and a bristle nose. She's got some live plants from us. And uh, she's looking for some tank mates that can go in a 30-gallon hex. Um, yeah, so hex is okay for, for goldfish, you know, in general, I, th- I think. And so this is part of the problem when you get into a three-part question here. I have to remember back. I think it was uh, two one-inch goldfish and a bristlenose, which would be absolutely fine um, for now. But long-term, that's going to get pretty, uh, pretty cramped, I think. You're going to, well more cramped than I would like. And so you'll be doing a lot of water changes as those things kind of get pretty bulky and mass to them and you're gonna have to feed them quite a bit. And so tank mates probably don't make sense if you know you're gonna have to keep that aquarium with them for a long time. Now, if you know like, oh, well, don't worry, I have that tank right over there that's a 90 gallon tank and I can move whenever I want. Well, then that does open up some possibilities for you and uh, You know, we've got blog articles, so you've already bought from us, you've been to the website before. We actually have articles on tank mates for goldfish. We have videos like that as well. And so I won't bore you too much, but in general, what doesn't fit in their mouth and won't beat them up are good candidates. And so, you know, things like white clouds, even though they fit in their mouth, they're usually too fast. But being that you have a uh, hex tank, things can't run away as far, you know, like in a longer tank, they can sprint. If you have everyone kind of grouped up, you know, there's no um, there's no no escape, really. So, you know, do kind of factor that in. Things like a Hillstream loach that uses a glass is a better candidate. But then, you know, it's kind of competing with the bristlenose for food. You'll be feeding them either way, right? But, you know, it, it, similar space taking up and that kind of stuff. So, you know, watch some of the videos and see what you like. That That's one of the biggest factors is... I could list 10 fish, and if you don't like the way they look, you're not going to keep them. So find some stuff that visually is pleasing or the behavior is pleasing and go from there. All right. Um, Can I keep a male betta, some allergy eaters, and some bottom feeders together in a 20-gallon tank? Most likely. Um, Again, that comes into that aggression of a specific fish, but on a wide, wide spectrum, uh, male bettas given some ample space, which 20 gallons kind of considered to be ample space for that fish. Uh, most likely, he would tolerate some tank mates. Now, have a backup plan if he's just a killer and won't have any roommates. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but that's like another question. We do have um, videos and blog articles about that as well. So you can, you know, so if I say like, yeah, get some albino corridors and you don't know about albino corridors yet, you can read in the article or learn more about that fish and go, oh, yeah, I can see why that'd be a good bottom dweller. And, uh, you know, kind of stands out and depending on what color of gravel or substrate you have and the plants and you can make a, a plan for the long term. All right. By the way, up at the top of the chat, you can buy a T-shirt from Teespring. And I ordered this thing like six weeks ago. So Teespring moving pretty slow with the pandemic. I'm going to tell you that right now. But I finally got my Cardinal Tetra shirt that you might have seen on the community page. So it came in. I I, I really liked, I picked, I don't know, some kind of comfort t-shirt. And I was a little bit worried, but I'm digging it. I'm definitely ordering 
uh, like the angel and the discus and some of the other ones, which we'll, we'll be adding some more, by the way. We're just waiting for artwork to get completed, and we'll make stickers, and we'll have these shirts. And the good news is these shirts, you can buy them uh, all around the world. You know, they might take a couple months to reach, you know, I don't know where, you know, but they ship worldwide, so that's good. Okie dokie. What do I think is the best way to deal with a power outage if I have a tropical tank? Um, believe it or not, I've made a video on this, uh, but I think I actually got rid of it. What I find is under about eight hours, unless you have like a crazy high stock tank, I don't even worry about it. Um, so, you know, under eight hours, that's that covers like 90% of power outages, at least here in Washington and that kind of stuff. Like, oh, I'm not even worried about it, right? But past that, that's when it starts going, ooh, kidoki. dokie. And so if you've got some easy things around, you know, part of the problem is depending on when the power goes out, it's not fun. You know, if it's nine o'clock at night, you're watching, you know, whatever you're watching on Netflix and just boom, all the power's out and you get that awkward, I don't hear the fish tank, right? So what you can do if you you want to set up for the night, like let's say you're, I got to go to bed, whatever, right? And uh, so you can cover it in a blanket, you know, that'll retain some of the heat. Be very careful though that you make sure that you don't get some of the blanket in the water because then it'll wick the water out. Also take care of the way you drape it over so it's not like kind of touching a hang on back when power does kick back on. Now it's just like flowing over your blanket or something like that. So one, trying to preserve some heat is not a bad idea. And then uh, after that, you do start to worry about oxygen at some point, right? And if you have it ahead of time makes it super easy like uh let me find my props like if you're already using uh one of these usb nano air pumps which are back in stock by the way we were out for a good six weeks or something if you're already using one of these and you've got it of course i don't have the well i've got i've almost got it <laughs> this one would work but you can have them they're already like they're plugged in and they work um can you hear it? If I put airline tubing on there, now you can't hear it, right? You can actually hear the air though. So like this thing uh, I used in Peru, this will run it for like four days. So if you have any kind of battery backup, but maybe you don't, maybe you're like, I'm not that tech person, I don't have that. You might have a, a laptop. Plug this thing into your laptop, let that go till that battery dies. You can get yourself some some air going. Because that's the next that's the next uh problem you got. Heat, you know, but they can cool down quite a bit. Think in shipping and that kind of stuff, they can cool down. And air or oxygen is actually one of the biggest threats. And why is that a threat when it's not a threat when you're shipping fish? Well, in an aquarium, actually most of the oxygen's being used up is by bacteria and plants and things like that. Yes, fish definitely are taking oxygen in also. But when you're in a bag of fish and you're being shipped, it's just fish and water. That's why we don't put live plants in uh, bags when we ship them, because they use up oxygen. So we're in a state where we don't want to lose filtration, and once you start losing bacteria and it starts dying, it makes ammonia. And then that ammonia starts you know, kind of making a worse situation. So trapping heat and then air. And if we, we go like really prolonged, you know, and this is like, oh man, we're going to be out for days, right? So hopefully if you're in that scenario, you've got a generator. If you don't, that's where we got to get, uh, you know, we got to get crafty. And what I would say there is a barbecue is helpful. You can warm water up. Now you can never pour, well, I shouldn't say you can't. You should never pour water from like a, a kettle or something like that, from a barbecue or a fire, straight into your aquarium. That hot water will just kill everything it touches. Plants, bacteria, fish. As you pour that in, it will just scald stuff. So what you have to do is you actually get a, a kind of like a, a bucket of water out of there and you mix really hot water into that and you get that to where you're like, oh, that feels like lukewarm-ish. You could pour that into the aquarium and you could, uh, one, perform a water change if you were having bacteria die off, and two, heat the aquarium up very slowly. Now, that's not, it's not an easy method, and it's not quick, 
So it's a lot of work. And so at that point, but what I find is unless it's getting crazy cold, crazy cold, just don't touch it. Let the air go. Don't feed. Definitely don't feed. And just kind of keep the, the, the hatches batten down. Now, if you got extra stuff laying around, like, oh, I had some heat packs, you can put those under the tanks and stuff and try and get some heat to rise up there. Um, but most people don't have heat packs laying around. So that is, I think those are the practical scenarios to actually deploy for most people outside of having the generator and having the real backup plans going and having battery-operated air pumps set up to go. And I wish I had that because that would be perfect. But you can get battery backups that have a built-in plug and they have the USB port, right? And so you can you can just have them plugged in, and when the power goes out, this just automatically kicks on. So it's kind of an awesome backup, and you can get ones from Anker, and they're like 25 bucks. I, I have a couple of them I use them for cameras and stuff, but uh, we used them in Peru, and, and they're great in hotel rooms. Like if you need, you know, like for now on, when I go to a convention, I'm gonna bring a little bit of air, these little air, and air pump. I won't say more than one, I'm probably just one, because I don't plan on getting that many fish. But then I could uh, run an airstone and keep things keep them around. Uh, yeah, and while we're on the the topic here, I'll take off the little protective plastic so it looks better on camera. Ah. We upgraded the USB capabilities of this, so now we ship so you get a two two thing because people were buying so many of them and they were like running fish tanks and they were plugging them into power strips. They were running out of spots to only plug one thing in. And uh, now I believe, let's see, yeah, they're all 2.1 amp, which the ones before that were a little weaker. And in some scenarios, that didn't work out very well. Different power supplies, like I know we had one customer having a problem in Brazil and things like that. So uh, we upgraded it all, all around, better, better units. So, yeah, upgrading. I can't believe Ryo became a member only now. Come on, Ryo. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna steal your lunch if I ever come to. Well, Japan at the moment. I think you're in Japan, but either way, Japan or Singapore, I'm stealing your lunch uh, for waiting so long. Cause he's a buddy of mine and uh, makes great content. If you really uh, like looking at fish stores from across the world, that's a great look because he spends his time between Japan and between Singapore. So he's he's visited f like fish farms and plant farms and. In different stores, and his uncle's got rad rice fish collection. Um, so yeah, check it out. All right, lots of new members. Uh, Lisa Flegg, and we also had Jacob. Oh, I can't remember his last name. Jacob White or something like that. While we were in the chat, and I got a sticker from KG Cichlids. Boom! He found the one way to get money through without uh, subscribing to memberships because I turned off super chats because I want to answer the questions. I heard two small Fokka puffers. Can they be kept together in a 29-gallon? Yes, if you're looking to install a blender instead of a aquarium. Now, yeah, it, it's it'll probably work for a bit, like, but in general, that's why Fokka puffers are always beat up at stores, is because they beat on each other. And at a wholesaler, they they either go with like let's put 90 in the aquarium. They can't kill each other if they can't keep track of each other. But they definitely can bite on each other a lot. And uh, you might get lucky, though. There's always a chance of, like, turns out i got a male-female pair. They love each other from day one. I'm setting, you know, you, you might be setting the record, right? But in our experience at the store and looking at wholesalers, they, you know, more than one of uh, Faka Puffer is making a blender. And it's not a good one. Making fish soup. All right. Do fish pair up for mating, or can they? Oh wait, can you make them pair up? Uh, you know, there actually there's research about you know fish pairing up and stuff like that. In general, if you make a situation where there's only one male, one female, the odds of them just going okay, we give in and we will breed together are very high. But there are you know especially in like bettas where some betta personalities never get along with each other, and therefore uh, you just can't get them to spawn no matter what you're doing. But yeah, you can you can definitely skew your odds quite a bit. Um, yeah, but there's been a lot of studies on fish and like what is it the one-sided live bear um, genincia? I have to like see it because it's it's two words I can't pronounce uh, like genincia liniana, 
and it's the the spotted lie bearer, and they study him. And technically, the study says that only rights and lefts will breed. And so, their their hypothesis, and I think it's been disproven now, but it took a long time to disprove it. It's because some the fish can only move their gonopodium one way or the other, and they were the hypothesis was that because they're pretty hard to breed, even though they're a lie bearer, was that. You could only breed, like if the male could move his reproductive organ to the right, it could only breed with a left female and vice versa. And so that was, you know, it's kind of like I think the uh, the sword tail, I'm going to call it wives tail at this point because it's been debunked now, that sword tails could change sexes. That's what we thought for a very long time. And what it was is hormones and things like that just suppressing males developing male attributes. So they were always males and they could be suppressed for years at a time and then express all their male traits later. Um, and now we know that's actually how you get the biggest, most dominant males is you get them to just uh, keep looking like females. You eventually get them in their own aquarium. They fill out those male sword tail features and stuff, and you have this mammoth show of sword tail on your hands. Would I rather have shrimp-sized dogs or dog-sized shrimp? 100% I'd rather have dog-sized shrimp. Can you imagine having a little army of little babies? I mean, big shrimp. The, the thing is, like, we kind of have big shrimp, and those are, like, lobsters and and crayfish and stuff, and they're scary. I don't like touching them. I don't like, you know, when they pinch you or when they just, I don't know, they feel weird, and when it cr like when all their legs are on you, it gives me kind of the willies, right? But, you know, imagine I had, like, four little dogs sitting here. It just seems... Even if they peed on you, you'd just be like, oh, it's laughable. So I definitely, I think that's the winner. No contest. Ha. Looking to get some Geophagus tapahos, which are an earth eater, by the way, uh, to keep and breed. Can six do well in a 75? If so, I'd recommend two males and four females. I would, yes. So he also said, or one male and four females. I think two. When you get one, sometimes you'll get a lame duck where with no competition, he's too lazy to do any breeding, and so you want to do breeding. And so I would shoot for the two males, four females. Plus, they look a little better. And uh, But, yeah, I think you can pull that off in a 75. No problemo. They're a little bit more rowdy than maybe a Jirapari or something, but not too bad. Now that I've separated opinion from the truth, well, I don't know that we've... So this is going back to Spencer's original thing about the good he is. I don't know that we actually have... Well, because we don't know what the truth is, we we definitely know that probably there's a lot of opinions. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. Do you think a 15-gallon or a 20-gallon hex are enough to at least start a colony of the Zenataka and Doyodori? Uh Yeah, you could definitely start them in there. Long term, I want a little bit more. If you can just get it to be a jungle in there where you can barely see the fish, you'll get a lot of fry production out of it. Um the, the big thing you got to watch for with the goodie is, is getting too warm. And so I'm not worried about the space so much in a 15 or 20 gallon. It's mostly, you know, you're like, oh, it's hot out. It's been hot out for like a week. And then you're looking and be like, oh, my God, I got horrible bacterial infections on my, my goodie is. And it'll be because it got too hot. And so um, watch for that. You know, definitely get ahead of cooling with evaporative cooling and all that kind of stuff ahead of time before your AC breaks or, you know, you leave the door open and got a little too hot in there, whatever's going to happen. When you're buying 10 Tetras to school, can you do four green, three cardinal, and three neons, or do you do 10 of each? Uh, you can do either. In my opinion, the four, three, and three looks terrible, just from like, a, like an OCD, like, ah, why would you do that? And they don't quite school up the same as a, a pack of one type. Um, but if, if, you know, if you got a collectoritis going on, there's, you know, there won't be any worse for it really. And yeah, it, it'll be fine. You know, there's going to be purists that say like, well, technically they all want to be in schools at like 40 billion each. Well, that's true. But in the real world, like it'll be fine. Wow, $50 sticker. I want to see someone beat that. And not by you guys. I mean, another uh, fish YouTuber. I don't think I've ever seen a $50 sticker. Well, thank you, Evan. That is, you're setting a bar there. I don't know what the bar means, but uh, I appreciate that. That's, what am I going to put that to? I'm going to put that towards solving 
uh, the uncomfortable, sweaty situation I was in earlier of driving to the airport and back with broken air conditioning in the U-Haul. You know, we got this box truck that used to be a U-Haul, and air conditioning is broken, and it's basically a scene out of like a movie where, like, like a Tommy Boy, where fat guy is sweating and like just things keep going wrong. Well, I got to pick up these plants. So that's that's my mission this weekend. Like, what am I going to do? I got to get this thing either like fix a few things or figure out a different van situation. And uh, yeah, so that $50 going to the hopefully I don't have to get out of the van and be that sweaty guy when you walk into the cargo pickup place. Just what you guys wanted to hear, by the way. How do you get rid of staghorn allergy? Well, you get a staghorn hawk, of course. No, uh, usually that comes about from maybe too much iron or too many organics in the water, so an imbalance in your aquarium. Getting rid of it, it's not as easy as hair allergy because a toothbrush doesn't tend to work as well. So, uh, you know, kind of uh, pulling the tufts as you can, you know, kind of pull out what you can. And then get yourself like some flagfish. Flagfish are a little rowdy, and uh, but they're good at just kind of uh, 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 and pulling it off. But if you have real fine plants, they'll do that too, like... Uh, baby tears, dwarf baby tears, pearl weed, all the, or like rotalas, any of that kind of stuff. They're, they're good at like doing that yank and they'll pull plant leaves off the plants that way too. So, you know, you get, you get some good with some bad on that one. Is it cruel to put rams with eco complete? I know they're sand sifters, but I worry about putting them in a tank that doesn't have sand. I don't think it's cruel at all. They, they are, like micro sand sifters, that's true, but um, they almost never do it. Like it's not that they don't, because epistogramas do it too, right? But of all the epistos and everything I've kept over the years, I only kept them in sand a few times, and it was to witness the behavior, and they did really well outside of that. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel bad about it. Yeah, I and unless you were like feeding a food where you're like, you know. <laughs> Like, oh, here's a sharp substrate. Like, ugh, like, get in there, food. Let me make you really dig for it and hurt yourself. Like, you're not going to do that. So I think you're going to be fine with all that stuff. Oh, man. Another one from Bert. That's a transformer. Oh, wait, no, a chair? My chair doesn't do that at all. I can only do this move. But can you do this? Who else watches PewDiePie sometimes? I do. Rarely now, though. I don't have time. I'm on the fence. Do I get a 55 gallon tiger barb tank? Oh wait, he's asking, or he's talking about that. He saw a video of the big boy 300 barbs and got sold. Are 25 barbs and four hillstream loaches good for a 55? Yes, I think that's gonna be a fun tank. I really, you know, I really fell in love with tiger barbs and I, I miss them, honestly, like they're, I didn't like, what was it? They dominated food hard. But that's, like, I could do them in a smaller tank again. And what I mean by smaller is like a 75, 55, anything like that sounds awesome. Them dominating your your uh, your 800, not as awesome. But I really do like them. And I, I do miss that aquarium. Like, people are like, why do you make aquariums suck so much? Like, well, first, I'm not trying to be bad. Like, that's... That's an unintended consequence of me being bad, right? Uh, we shouldn't have had to look at this, like, empty aquarium for this long, but there's a pandemic, and plans got put aside, and we had the sneak attack on babies. Let's see, can we see any of the babies? Yeah, I'm going to do the super zoom so you guys can look at super babies uh, while I try and talk about stuff. Focus. Oh, there they are. See them? Calico one and the one in the back. Uh, so yeah, those are, oh, my head, my big old head was in the way. Now you're just looking at almost nothing, but yeah, so those, I got to move those guys and I got to, you know, I want to put the background in there and Dean and I have been talking about what we want to do and we actually, you know, we did a members only live stream yesterday, not Dean and I, but, uh, for the members and we were talking a little bit about that. Wow. If I just even touch the desk, it like shakes cause it's so zoomed in. Will it focus on me? Wow. Now that's a focus right there. I'm watching you. All right. Let me let me let me get the super zoom off. All right. But yes, Tucker Barbs are awesome. And 
You'll just have to wait and see what we got in store for this bad man pajama. $49.99 from SC Aquatics. This has got to be a record. Like, YouTube's probably going to be like, we'd like to talk to you about your sticker game. Seems strong. And I'll be like, no, my fans are strong. Just so happens when you take away their super chats, they'll give you the stickers, which I'm finding enjoyable. So, not to be, not to be topped by Andrew Miner, who's a new member, and Alan Bugtongue. That's kind of a cool last name, Bugtongue. You say Bugtongue? No, I said Bugtongue. All right. How many angelfish would you recommend would be good in a 40-gallon planet tank with some Rummy Nose Tetris and some Corys? Uh, about 350. No. I think three. Three is kind of nice. One's fine, too. Like, it's, it's really hard for me because sometimes... Whatever I see someone else have, I'm like, that one. Like, I'm that meme that's like, I have a fish tank. I should make that meme. Someone make this meme for me, and I want to see it. And then, just, like, Photoshop my face really badly. Like, you know that one that's like, he's got his wife or his girlfriend, and he, like, looks at another girl? That's how I am with fish tanks of, like, I could have an angel fish tank, and it'd be six, and it's pretty cool, but then a different number or a different type, and I'm like, oh, that one's sweet, too. So, like, when you what, I, what I'm going with that is... When you got one angel that has, like, never been picked on and its fins are perfect in every way, that's really hard to compete with. But then also when you got, like, a school, like, when, like, three of them move, that's really cool, too. So, you know, I could go either way. And I think just having some really healthy-looking angelfish, regardless of um, the number of them, is going to look good. You know, I avoid two just because you get a pair – if you're lucky, if you get two males, two females, it gets a little weird. So one or three or more is what I go with. And I wouldn't go too many more in the 40 unless you're, uh, you know, a, a glutton for punishment on the water changes and the, the fin nippings. I'm building a fisher in my garage. Any advice? Yeah. Um, dehumidifier. That That's the one takeaway. Like, no matter how you do anything else, dehumidify. It gets unbearable in the summer. It's going to help you heat in the winter. And, uh, you know, you don't want to ruin a building because what will happen is you won't know you're ruining it. You're just like, oh, yeah, fish room, fish room, fish room. Two years later, you look and you're like, oh, my God, I got black mold. What's going on here? And it's like, yeah, well, you know, you, you had a lot of water in there. It takes a while to build up. And you don't want anything. You know, it just takes one extra flood, one extra thing. You know, it just, it, over time, it just stacks up on you. It's a slow, slow way to take down that building. All right. I'm going to talk about a new product because I can. It's my show. My show. The aquarium co-op tubing is now back in stock. New and improved. We don't put it in the cardboard where it gets kinked anymore. We have it rolled to aquarium co-op specifications. If you hold up some kind of measuring device, you will find that this is a perfect whatever you want to call it. It matches the O in aquarium co-op perfectly. We had that measured and done. And this tubing is made out of food grade PVC plastic. Yeah, clearly food grade. Tested by me. Wasn't sure till now. But you get 25 feet for the low, low price, I think, of 5 bucks, And it's quality, and it's not kinked this time. And, uh, yeah, buy it all. I brought in a ton, but I know I didn't bring in enough, so we're already ordering more because it's selling like hotcakes. But if you're looking for tubing that's awesome, this is it. You know, not that there's, you know, I always, I always seem to improve upon the products that don't really need much improving. Really all you're, you're getting here is, oh, by buying this from Aquarium Co-op, it's not going to be that crazy tubing that I bought that one time that got all weird and slimy and then looked weird and then I don't know what was going on and then, you know, it's it's this quality. You know, it's not going to last forever. It is nice. It's good. It's cheap, right? But that's what we're doing. We're focusing on the necessities. And so we brought in the the big linear air piston pump, we got the small air pumps, we got the rad tubing, we got the rad never clog air stones, which I don't have in front of me. Oh yeah, we did bring these in, you know, the, the taps, the valves. So 
Yeah. Buy it all up. It's good times. And uh, it goes into funding the next the next thing we slightly improve upon. <laughs> Ooh, KB Aussies. I don't recognize KB Aussie 59. I hope, KB Aussie 59, you are a member. My hope is always, if you're going to shower me with love like this, Please be a member first because that allows me to reciprocate a bit and at least give you a selfie or I'll say member only live stream, but I've only ever done that like twice ever in the last three years. So I don't want to promise member only live streams very often. Uh, I was in the mood yesterday. You know how it is. We got Joe joining the team and BQ. I think, can we all agree that BQ is missing another B? BBQ? Anyone? All right. Ooh, and a sticker from Vern. Thanks, Vern. Which fish can I fit the most in a 10-gallon aquarium? Well, we've got this nerd answer, and then we got a real answer. So the nerd answer, I would say the Dracula fish. It's like this translucent, tiny little tetra that's hard to track down. It only gets like half an inch or something stupid. And you see them every once in a while in like those micro aquariums. They're like, I got a school of fish. Doesn't look very cool, but I pulled it off. And then you got something practical like, okay, I got a 10 gallon and I want a bunch of little buddies in there. What could I do? And I would go with something with like green neon tetras would be a decent one. Uh, uh, Bridgette rasboras, exclamation point rasboras, strawberry rasboras. Clown Achilles, Norman Lamp Achilles, any of those, you could stock up on a bunch of those bad boys and uh, probably just break the bank before you run out of space. I mean, there some people got a big bank, but, you know, not everybody. Well, that one's hard. What Frederick DeVost? Is that actually pronounced, like, with all those special characters, is that Frederick, or is it like, I, I don't even know, I don't even know what the variant would be. That's how, I don't even know where to go with that one. Least killifish, they are a pretty good one. Yeah, least killifish are pretty decent. I have those in the fish room. I also like uh, tiger teddies, which are another type of live bear. Mm. How are sassy and tinky and the dogs? Is there another meme review in the works? No, well, I mean, it's not in the works. Like, they'll probably build up and maybe I'll do another one someday, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't say one's in the works at the moment. Uh, Sassy's getting real old, you know, she keeps like falling off a ramp and, and she s spends most of the day sleeping. And so like we took her for a walk, like we, my wife held her the whole time in, in a baby Bjorn. <laughs> I think that's what that thing's called, right? Baby Bjorn? I think. I don't have any babies, so I just, I think it's a baby Bjorn. So carries the dog around on that. We walked Wincy and Tinky and, uh, it was a good time, you know, good 20 minute break and then got back to work. But yeah, it's, it's sad, you know, we, it's, it's sad to know like, man, she could be gone tomorrow, you know, so you kind of just like try and enjoy and spend time as much as we can and spoil her. You know, today I made myself some tuna fish. So, you know, while, while mom wasn't looking here, eat some tuna fish and have stinky tuna fish breath, you know, spoiler when you can, but yeah, that's enough of the, enough of the downers. Oh no. When do you think you'll upload another video on the Unique Viewers? Uh, I don't think I ever am going to upload another video. I don't have any planned. I am intrigued in live streaming there, though. <clears throat> uh, I almost, I've almost live streamed there probably three times in the last two weeks. The problem is, I kind of, as I'm going to bed, I'm like, man, I really want to live stream tomorrow. That's going to be so fun, right? Because I'm going to bed. That's why my eyes are closed, by the way. So I'm thinking about like, ooh, what do I want to do tomorrow? I could talk about business like on that channel. I could do, you know, like a morning live stream that people have been asking for in Europe and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do something tomorrow. And then I get up and I open up like Messenger and I'm like, oh my God, my world's on fire. There's something going on at the warehouse. The dev team's got this. Oh no, Candy's got a thing we got to solve, you know, like with a customer. And by the time I put out all those fires, either A, it's I got to go to the airport or B, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I'm drained, and I, I got to do some other stuff. So, yes, I, I do want to do some more stuff. I love talking business. I love talking business. And there's a lot of articles that come up and a lot of stuff. And I'm like, ooh, but I just haven't had the time. And that's, I'm trying to I'm trying to make the time. There's, you know, I'm doing some real strategic stuff right now. 
you know, I kind of I kind of went to the third person view and looked at my own back of my head and going, okay, how do we make it so that Corey's got some time to actually accomplish the things he wants to accomplish? Because right now he's got a long list of stuff he wants to do, and this stuff's getting in the way of it. This stuff's super important, and then this stuff's important. But this stuff, my stuff's on fire. I gotta put that out type of stuff. So I gotta figure out how do we offload more of that stuff. And and I've already Randy's already on fire. You know, we hired him a couple years ago. I've transferred as much fire to him as I can. He's permanently on fire. You know, he's the human flame at this point. So we're we're having to navigate that one. Are Cardinal Tetras and Emperor Tetras shrimp safe? I'd say Cardinal Tetras are mostly shrimp safe. Ember Tetras or not Ember, sorry, Emperor Tetras, they get big enough that mm, you know, they're, they're going to take them to snack town a little bit on some of those babies. Uh, but in a very densely planted tank, you can get uh, the emperor tetra breeding, and you can usually get the shrimp populating more than they're being consumed also. So it could be done, but, you know, if you're worried about that, it's your first shrimp colony, go with the cardinals. All right. When you quarantine fish, do you just dose once and let them sit or follow the box directions? I can't find a video where you address this. Uh, so there is a couple of them, and, and that's part of what we're working on the website is how do people find information better that we've already done. We know that's a problem. So when we quarantine, what we do is we treat once, right? And I've, I think I've got the meds, but we treat once. Hey, I found my failure earlier. I do have an Everclog Air Stone. I put that in the drawer. I won't have that mistake again. So anyway, back to quarantine. We do treat once, and then we're observing. So we put meds in. We go, hey, here's a bunch of meds to stop most things we see. And then we watch. Now, if one specific thing breaks out, like, ooh, ick is breaking out hard, we change tactics. We go, hey, instead of the shotgun approach, we now know what we're fighting. We're fighting ick. Now we're only going to use ick and we're going to follow those directions on the bottle. Same thing if we had a fungus infection. Same thing if we had a bacterial infection. Same thing if we saw, you know, like, they're really not putting on weight. We're really got to really gotta clean them out. And so, but yes, in general, start with the shotgun approach. Give them the critical eye and watch them for like a week. And if they come out that week and they just look squeaky clean and great, they probably are. And so then you don't need to... You know, change water, change water, change water, dose, 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 change water, dose. And, uh, you know, because that's, when you get fish in, like maybe get them in from breeder or, or Dean or something like that, the odds of them not being healthy are really low. But all it takes is one kind of pathogen getting through your defense, and now it's all through your fish room. For someone like me that's got a fish room, it's all over the place. And so... I, you know, I run with the policy of everything comes in, gets the trio, whether it's a store, whether it's my house, that's just the way it's got to be. And it's served us very well. I mean, for the most part, outside of like some goldfish issues a couple of times over the years and a thing here and there, there's not a whole lot of like rampant disease. For as many fish as we're touching, as many aquariums we're doing, you know, like I've got, you know, I've had definitely had deaths from like, oh my God, they were breeding and that one killed that one. Dang. You know, they're, they're, I'm not saying I've never killed fish. I'm just saying proportionally to what I have laying around, like, it's doing, it's, it's working its magic for me. Welcome, Amber Evans. Welcome. Ooh, yes, Amber Evans using the emojis with the wizards. I forgot we had the wizard. I should make the wizard the two-year mark, but that would let Candy off the hook. I, I, I should have Jimmy make Candy's head with, like, on an octopus body. <laughs> Will I ever do salt water on this channel? And I say this channel because I've done salt water in the past. I've had reef tanks. I've had stuff. Uh, it's always a possibility. I, I definitely, there's times I'm like, yeah, that'd be super fun. And then I think about like, well, I'm not nearly as well versed in salt water as I am fresh water. Like I don't live, eat, and breathe salt water like I do fresh water every day, day in, day out. And then I think, saltwater sounds fun until I think about the internet critiquing everything I do. And then it doesn't sound fun anymore. So, like, I do think about, should I be, should I have a secret saltwater layer that I just hang out in and no one knows? That sounds awesome. Should I show the public? And then I'm like, no, definitely not. 
So that's kind of how I fall on that. And then I'm like, well, I don't want to do stuff I can't show you guys, so ah, I just won't do it. That's usually where I come down to. Uh, U.S. people build some time Bulgaron Chromus microlepis. That's the emperor cichlid from Lake Tanganyika, right? Us people build some time? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe the two-year mark you're suggesting that fish? Not sure. By the way, I saw some pretty cool video on that at the Greater Seal Aquarium Society online meeting where Pam Chin had footage of like thousands of those migrating. It was pretty neat. My video is, my video quality is grainy. I feel like, and some of you guys can feel free to correct me. I feel like that's probably Bika's internet or the setting. Like on my, well, let me check. Let me see if my, it currently does not say my thing is on fire. So, I'm going to assume it's not on fire. We'll assume that. So it should be working okay, I think. Oh, candy already fixed it. Good, 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 good. Candy's worth a million pieces of candy for sure. By the way, where's my cookies, candy? <laughs> I troll candy by asking for cookies. Because I know that... I'm trolling her because I know that she doesn't have access to flour at the moment. <laughs> not that we have that much flour either, but... It's a, it's how we get through the day, you know. We can't poke fun at each other. Otherwise, like Candy and I's interactions are are pretty uh, like I don't know. We, we're always just just discussing how we failed a customer or something's gone horribly wrong. And so, if you don't make light of the situation somehow, it's just like you, you start feeling like, oh, geez, what's Candy got to say? Oh, we lost seven hundred dollars in lights in a package. Oh, good, you know. So. The, the candor, at least that's what helps me. It helps me from get through the day instead of just crying like, why can't, why do we got to lose things? Why is this going to happen? All right. How many neon touches in a 30-gallon tank with six cherry barbs? 26. Yep, 26. I have clumps of yellow and pink fungus in my tank. Where'd it come from? I have no idea. Yellow and pink? Ooh, wait. Pink... Well, sometimes pink, you can get like a pink color when blackbeard algae turns pink from getting killed. But yellow and pink, that's not common. I don't know about that one. That one, if you put a piece of wood in there, sometimes you can get, or rock, you can have pieces of lichen that were on the rock, kind of when it was out in the wild, you put it in and that kind of reactivates. But, you know, honestly, I don't know what that is. All right. Um, France says, I see mass predatory fin, but never big cichlid tanganyika. I mean, if you're looking for video on it, I filmed some back when we visited a store in Ohio, something fishy. He had some big ones down in the breeding facility. They weren't breeding themselves, but he was growing out to breed them. So like I have seen them in person, not very often because they're, you know, not many people need a three-foot cichlid that would bite your arm off, right? Well, it won't literally bite your arm off, but they, they're no joke. You know, you can see videos of them fighting big turtles and stuff. Uh, where was I going with that? I don't know. What's my favorite oddball or uncommon live-bearing fish? I really like Celebes half-beaks, but any half-beak is super cool. And what about... I, mean, I still want to try Anableps. That's one I haven't done. Bellisonics. Or baloney socks. That's one I haven't kept myself, the pike live bearer. I've had a lot of chance to get them. I'm not a huge fan of fish that eat other fish, but because it's a live bearer and I haven't done it yet, I'm drawn to it. So that's still on my, you know, I'm going to do that someday list. All right. Is air freight getting any easier recently? No. <laughs> Opposite. So when I was I went to the airport twice this week, um, supposedly from Memorial Day weekend and all that kind of stuff, Seattle is so backed up. They're starting to just turn flights away, like cargo. Like, no, we're not, no more cargo into Seattle. Like, what? What do you mean? No more. And so we definitely had to call some reps and get, you know, like, we got live goods coming, like plants. Like, it can't be sitting around forever. And uh, what, what was a four-day shipment, so we, we always pay for, like, you know, the reason we put them through an airport is so we can get them quick, right? 
you know, because our like our bill today, I think uh, we had two shipments: one that the vendor pays for, one that I pay for, and that that bill was like six hundred dollars for you know twenty seven boxes of plants, right? So that's like twenty some bucks a box. Or no, wait, uh, brain not working. Twenty seven. It's like uh, twenty. 20, yeah, twenty dollars a box. Why? I, I want to go a hundred. I'm like, no, that's gonna be thousands of dollars. That's not right. Twenty seven dollars a box, which per box ain't that bad, really. But the price has been coming up, and uh, you know, and flights are getting harder and more difficult. And so usually, what would be like, oh, they landed at, you know, ten a.m. today. Now they're landing at two p.m. and it's hard to get here to get to the live stream. And a lot of times they're landing at six p.m. or tomorrow. And that's where some of them where I'm like, yeah, I can't live stream today, guys. I, I literally have to go to the airport because we don't want them sitting, getting too hot, too cold. And just the longer they're in boxes, the the less easy they transition into our system. And so we want to minimize that time. So now we're, we're buying everything to be next flight guaranteed, which will speed it up a little bit, which means we can now pay 30% more to get slightly slower service than we used to get before the pandemic. So you just got to do what you got to do to get it done. And that's what we're going to do. So yeah, not getting easier, unfortunately. Fish coming in from the farms. Still, that's like a nightmare. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, not good. The, the fish list looks super weak, honestly. Like we look at them, it's like, whew, yeah, that's not good. <clears throat> How can I get my Pleco to eat? He's not eating any of the algae wafers or veggies I put in. Uh, maybe dim the light, feed him after dark, try some Apache food. If all of that's not working, maybe you got to deworm him. Um, like uh, some General Cure, or some Paracleanse or something like that. Or check water parameters. How many tanks? Too many? More than you have time to clean. Depends on the time of your life. I've had times where like five's too many. I've had times where hundred's not enough. Right now, right now it feels like whatever I have is too many because I can't really do anything. So I'm just like, oh, let me go feed the fish. Okay, let me get out the onboard. You know, because I can't really like work on. It. I really enjoy the building, the working, all of that aspect of a fish tank. And right now it's just like not optimal time to be playing with that stuff. So it's like eh, it's more of a chore than it is like I want to do it. So. All righty dokey. Can you put cherry shrimp in a 45? Sure. More the merrier. What's a good showpiece for a 40 breeder with 15 neons, eight glow lights, six green corridoras? I'm thinking of maybe in a pisto. Pisto would be fine. Uh, what about a jurapari? I like that fish a lot. Um, a blood parrot would be fine. There's going to be a lot of fish that fit into that category, honestly. But yeah, those are some options. You can breed betas in a five gallon and a few other certain fish. True. Speaks the truth. Um, whoa, I'm really going to want cookies? I do want cookies. I always want cookies. When do bristle nose start to show their bristles? I got a two incher without any. Wondering if I got a female. I find it usually about like the nine ish month mark because at like six to eight months, you're like, hey, there's a little bit of stubble there. But you don't know if that's male or female. Kind of like 9 to 12 months. That's where you're going to see like, oh, yeah. Yeah, we got a male on our hands. He's getting big old and bushy there. But before that, it's like, well, you can suspect and go, I think. The UV light I was asking about is an algae scrubber. What would be a good time to schedule? What's a good time schedule I should use? Well, if you got an algae scrubber, the way they're built, you'd be running at 24-7. If it's a true algae scrubber. 24-7 on that thing. Uh, where do blood parrots come from? Where do pet stores order them from? And what condition What condition do they come in? Uh, so a blood parrot is a cross, I believe, between um, a Midas cichlid and a Severum originally. They've been you know, kind of line bred at this point. They might have some more stuff mixed in to change them a little bit at this point. I'm not 100% sure on all of the lineage. You know, and there's things like King Kong blood parrots and then normal blood parrots, and then you've got dyed blood parrots and all of that. Um, but I can answer a little bit more. The pet stores are going to get them from wholesalers, and wholesalers are going to order them in usually from overseas, uh, like bigger fish farms. And those will be raised up in mass quantities. And, 
Yeah, so kind of like the other, most of the ways fish would come in normally. And the condition they come in, in general, because they're a cichlid, cichlids are fairly good at handling transit and uh, adverse conditions. And so they tend to be better than your average fish. Like they've, they're more forgiving, I would guess, to bad conditions. So the condition they come in, like when they land, like okay-ish, like usually you don't have big losses. They can tolerate just excess ammonia and things like that in the bag better. Um, but yeah, I would, so I, would, I wouldn't worry. Like if someone was ordering you some in, I'd be like, ah, oh, blood parrots should be pretty easy. Like there's always horrible scenarios like that didn't work out. But then for the most part, I'd be like, yeah, they'll work out. Easy test strips on the line somewhere. Oh, they're in the house. I was testing some new ones two days ago. But yes, working on it. How can I do an auto water change from a saltwater rack that I use to cultivate brine shrimp? I've got eight 20 gallon tanks on the rack. The way I was going to do it, because I was going to do it, is if you go way back in the way back machine, when we, right over here actually, I had what was like the 700 gallon water tank. I was going to get myself like a two or 300 gallon water tank. And I was going to put it on the outside of the building. I can't remember exactly why I wanted to put it on the outside, but for whatever reason, I was putting it on the outside of the building. And I was going to bring a hose to the inside. And I was going to mix up hundreds of gallons of salt water at a time and just let a power head just kind of keep it churning in there and keep oxygen going. And then, because in the Wayback Machine, I used to change water with a power or a pump and a timer. And the timer would turn on for a minute and it would pump water to change like the koi totes. I was going to do something similar with uh, brine shrimp hatcheries. So my goal was how can Corey 100% automate brine shrimp hatching? And one of the biggest things is getting rid of the eggs and refreshing the water on them and things like that. And so I was like, well, if I had a hose that, so my, my brain process was like, okay, there's a hose, it turns on, it flushes out all the eggs, that drains, and I'd have a solenoid like I would use to change water right now that would open up for five minutes, let that water go through, close off. Five minutes later, turn on enough to fill the container with salt water, let that sit for a few hours, and then I would use an auto feeder uh, to dose the brine shrimp eggs. I know, that's a crazy amount of steps just to not do a little bit of work, but the mental exercise of figuring that out is way more fun than just doing it. So that's why I do that kind of stuff. But it was outside because I wanted to be able to raise it up high so I could gravity feed. Oh, that might have been why, because I didn't want to have to use a pump, and so I was going to gravity feed with a solenoid. Opens up, lets water flow, closes back down. But I figured it had to be pretty high, and so it was going to be outside to do that. Yeah, that's, that's how I was going to do it. But, you know, I don't know of another great way. Uh, found a VMO video of the gunmetal goldfish. Searching goldfish online, what are your thoughts about the goldfish council? I don't know. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about them. Um, you know, I, I have no idea if they're like, oh, yeah, they're just certified fish police or if they're made up of a bunch of people that are like goldfish enthusiasts that are super open and welcoming. I have no idea. Um, so I don't have an opinion, really. Alina, Elena, 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 Elena. $5, keeping it up. I know, I should be working out right now. Whew. And Jessica becoming a member. Well, thank you very much, as well as Yankees99. Woo! Corridors and neon tetras in a 55-gallon tank. How many of each for that big schooling action? I would do a 12-pack of Corridors. I wouldn't go, whoa, I just, my knee just uh, hit my file cabinet. 12-pack Corridors. I wouldn't go too strong on them. But then, like, 50-plus Neon Tetras. By the way, I did a video that's 24 minutes long about Neon Tetras. You thought that was impossible, and then you remembered Corey was talking, and he can talk for way too long about nothing. But I do cover things like Neon Tetra disease, and that's pretty much all I cover, really. Mycobacterium and stuff, TB. Um, yeah. No, that's not true. I talk about the care of Neon Tetras. But yeah, 22-minute video about Neon Tetras. You can take that to the bank. Well, hello, Amber Evans, with all the emojis. What do I think about the Pacific Blue-Eyed Fish? Pacific Blue-Eyed Fish. I don't know what that is. And then it went away, so... Yeah. 
What is the best way to disinfect a sponge filter after tuber 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 tuberculosis disease? Uh, my guess is probably some kind of like hot, hot water. Like I, I don't want to tell you to boil it because I have never boiled a sponge filter. So it could be like, it melted, you dummy. Like, oh, well, oh, my bad. Um, well, so maybe hot water or I would do a lot of bleach. So you could do a, like a bucket of bleach and you let that thing sit in there for like a week and then rinse it super well, put it in another bucket that just has water and a bunch of dechlorinator and that will dechlorinate the chlorine as well or the bleach. So kind of treat it like recharging Purigen if you've ever done that. Maybe you haven't though. Hmm. I set up a Daphnia tank and it looks horrible. Got healthy Daphnia though. Should I throw in some snails? I would. Not too many though. They can breed up a storm and steal your calcium. Uh, I know you shouldn't clean the bottom, but it's getting gross. That bottom layer is the perfect substrate for eggs when they start laying them. Like normally they hatch out, but when they get stressed, they're gonna lay eggs. And because they molt so often, yes, it's gonna be gross. You know, I. I, I won't say don't change water, but when you do take water out, like let's say you're harvesting, try to siphon from the bottom or something like that. But in general, don't be afraid of bad looking water. Nature has bad looking water everywhere and stuff is thriving. So look at that as like, you know, what I would do is me. Like I look at that like gold. You got gold down there. And like imagine you siphon a little bit of that up and you start a new tank. Man, instant cycle. Like, it's really going to bring a bunch of goodies you want. Oh, no, Daphne, you're hatching out while I'm cycling my tank. It's only the best thing ever. How do I... Wait, how do I know if my Cori Habrosis are stressed? Uh, if they never came out, if they didn't school up, if, uh, you know... There's, yeah, you got to kind of like... One of it is... If you've ever had them before or you observe them at the store and you're like, hey, they're swimming around, these ones aren't. You know, look for if like they're not doing something you think they should be. But in general, they should be happy-go-lucky little little buddies. So if they're out and about, you know, kind of doing their like, oh, I'm just kind of going around the tank looking for food, probably doing good. Welcome, Jim. How's the meds going for the intestinal worms? The worms that start with a C. Camelanus redworm? Still waiting to hear back. Yeah, Maria. I got it right here. I've been testing. I've been testing. And I don't have the good answer for you yet. So that's why we don't sell it yet. And I told you when I met you, you know, you could buy it somewhere else, but I can't sell it until I've got the aquarium co-op recommended dosing instructions that work. And I need a lot more Camelanus redworm to uh to really be scientific with. Right now, my brain is focused on planaria because way more people have planaria issues than they have Camelanus redworm issues. They're both prevalent, but I'm focusing on the the uh, planaria issue first because I don't have a bunch of Camelanus redworm laying around, and we don't necessarily want to be like, all right, who's got the Camelanus redworm? Go ahead and meet up at the store. Like that's we're trying not to do the old uh, the meetups. Can I add angelfish to a 75 gallon with some neons and silver tips? You can. If you don't keep them well fed, though, they might take neon tetra. They might invite them for dinner, if you know what I mean. And by invite them to dinner, I mean make them dinner. All right. Um, can I put the dechlorinator in the tank while the fish are in it? Yeah, you can. Um, man, I... I swear, I, oh, I took it off my desk because I needed to dechlorinate something. That's why. Ha. Yes, you can. Um, and specifically, most dechlorinators will call out what the, the time is. But like uh, Fritz Complete, it's instant. It, nothing's instantaneous, but it's as close to instant as you can get. It's like, oh, yes, mix it, dechlorinate, done type of deal. Or some do take a little bit longer to break the bond, but it's still nothing. None of them are a worry. Like if you put it in and you're putting water in, you're good to go. Okie dokie. Hmm. Any plans for a unique viewers video? How small biz wait, how does a small business know what type of new employees they need outside of normal employees? Hmm, I don't know. Probably not because I don't think I'm well versed in a subject like that. Like I'm still figuring out when I need to hire more 
like executive level employees more help. It's really easy when the numbers say like, like, well, is there a way I can show? I don't know. Well, yeah, I could show you this. I'll show you some super secret tech that we paid a developer to develop us that Randy would be like, hey, don't show people. But I'll show you guys because you're my friends. Oh, this isn't even the develop, or this isn't even, I have a super secret dashboard that like, you know, I just plug straight into my head. It's like the matrix. This is the one that we have for the employees. And so um, if you look at this, it's, yeah, nothing compromising here. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to block the, oh, there. So on this dashboard, oh, you can see how many orders we packed, orders remaining, items packed, remaining items, tomorrow's orders, all of that. And we have set off cutoff times and so uh, things like that. And so with data like that in front of you, and I have a lot more data on my board that I use here, uh, it's fairly easy to go, oh, okay, yeah, we're falling behind. We're not meeting the metric I want to make. And, and so we're going to hire more employees. And so like we have a new employee trying out tomorrow uh, because I want, my goal is actually, and I was talking about this in the live stream the other day, yesterday, uh, I want it so that if you place an order before noon Pacific Coast time, uh, it will ship the same day. So if you place it at 2 o'clock in the morning last night, it'll ship today. You you place an order at 11.30 today, it ships today. And uh, we're basically at that, but we're not at the level which we can guarantee it to yet. And so I'm hiring extra, extra people because I believe in in business right now in a landscape where you go to order something on Amazon and they're like, that'll be here next year. And you're like, what? What happened to the legacy of Amazon two-day free prime shipping? Why is it the two-day Amazon pre or prime shipping, even before the pandemic, actually meant four days, right? Like, huh, we're getting slower. Like, as they get bigger and, and, and better and more efficient, things are kind of slowing down. So I was like, hey, instead of paying for advertising, how about we just hire more people and our advertising is you guys going, I placed an order and then I took a bite of my sandwich and I heard a knock on the door and my Aquarium Co-op airline tubing was here. Because we've had some crazy stories. One person ordered like on a, on a Saturday and then Monday morning it was there in like Maine, which is like, you know, the other side of the country. Like sometimes, sometimes I impress myself with how good our employees are. But it, most times I'm just, I sit there as like proud dad going, good job guys, pulling it together. I like it. Okie doke. Hmm. It's true. I, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't going to tell people, but I am looking at analytics with shipping data. And so our shipping prices are down from $9.99. Now, that doesn't mean they won't go back up to $9.99 or be $10,000 or be free. I'm strategically testing some prices and looking at things and seeing what encourages people, where's profitable, where isn't profitable. Because at a certain point, like I know from analytics that on average, so on average, I think we did, we've done 8,000 orders this month. On average, the cost to ship an order is 1087. Now, if you order a four foot light, obviously it costs a lot more than that. If you order just one Airstone, it only costs us about eight bucks, right? But overall it's 1087. But the average consumer will say, I'm not paying $10 for shipping, that's crazy. So we have to figure out how much can we stand to lose so that the average consumer goes, oh, well, yeah, that, that shipping's okay. And so it's a fine line of like, if you feel that way at $7.99, we really need to charge $7.99. But if you only feel that way at $5.99, we got to find that too. Because like, we don't want to lose a sale, but you know, we can't be like super accurate and ship super quick and be super cheap. Like all of those going together is like, ah, it's just going to blow up. So we have to... Uh, you know, take our time and, and pause for a minute and sneeze because that's what's coming. <coughs> Woo! All right, we're back. Back in the game. Do dechlorinators have a negative impact on fertilizer? Not to the best of my knowledge. I've inquired about that before. I've, I, like, I talked to some sea chem chemists. I talked to Fritz chemists. And I talked to the people that make our fertilizer. And they all kind of came back with, 
Well, technically, because there's what caustic agents into chlorinator, it could, but in practicality issues, no. And I've, I've never seen an adverse effect either. So I was like, you know what? Three people or three groups of people that are smarter than me, and they all line up with my personal, uh, you know, pseudoscience of I poured stuff into a aquarium and saw what the fish did. Those all lined up. Seems good enough for me. All right. I did a water change for the first time in six months. All the fish did die. Never doing a water change again. I recommend watching the video called Why We Change Water. It will address that entire thing so that hopefully you never have to have that happen again. It's, it's an old uh, unfortunate situation, the old old tank syndrome. All right. That's right, get your mask on. I sneezed. Just wait for smell o vision That's when Aquarium Co-op hits their prime when smell o vision comes to YouTube, just so you know. My BF, I'm guessing boyfriend, and I order together, and we each pay $5 when shipping, so shipping was 10 So yes, I'll pay for shipping, but think twice at 10 No, I agree. I'm not, I'm not even trying to tell you guys that $10 shipping is, like, cheap. No, no, no. All I'm trying to go is, like, I'm a hobbyist turned business guy that has seen shipping costs just keep like crazy climbing up. And I'm like, what do I do? Because this is getting out of control and I got to find that sweet spot. And so that's what we're trying to do is like, we know that no one wants to pay shipping. But at the end of the day, someone's got to pay shipping. Like it doesn't, it's not going to move around the country for free. Right. And so if we want to stay competitive with other websites, they're going to have things at the minimum price just like us. And then, you know, like we, we do have some competitors like on a linear air piston pump, they're $30 cheaper than we are. So we look bad. And then you add it to the cart and then you're like, oh, it's $40 shipping. So we're actually cheaper, right? We try to make it just like super transparent and like, you know, I, I hope you guys believe me enough to know that when I say it costs 1087 on average for every single package, that that literally is a true statement. Some of you guys, like, you know, we looked at one like last month, you're like, shipping was $92. Like there were rock packs, there were the light, they were all this crazy stuff that couldn't box together, you know. And again, they spent over a hundred dollars, so it's free, you know. So when you look at the margin, you know they might have spent four hundred dollars. Like we made seven percent, and you're like, wait a second, that's twenty eight dollars on a four hundred dollar sale, and then you go, wait a second, two percent of that goes to the credit card company. So you're like, oh no. So okay, so we actually made twenty dollars. And you go, wait a second, if anything gets lost in the mail or there's any damage or they ask any questions to Candy, we're going to lose money. Dang it. You know, so we're, we're riding a real fine, like, you know, because we're trying to compete. Why well, I would I would say we are competing with like Amazons and that kind of stuff. So we're, we're playing this like, you know, we're at the top level in my head anyway. Like I in my head, you know, there's Jeff Bezos right here and I'm here and I'm shoulder to shoulder with that guy, <laughs> you know. But I'm, you know, I'm trying to play the high-level game and, and really try to bring you guys these products in a fast way and, you know, be the people that really, when you, when you send an email, we know about it. Like, we can go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know about that product and not just like, uh, the package here says this. And so we're trying to balance that. How do we keep a candy who is absolutely amazing and keep shipping cheap while shipping is going up? Like, how do we pull that out? Like, I've only got two arms and they're getting mixed up, right? Meanwhile, we got like, oh, we got to have Jimmy make videos because you guys want to see videos. And meanwhile, we got to do this and that. And it's all just complaining. So no one cares. But do know that shipping is getting cheaper. We are trying. And don't think for a second that any of us sit around just like counting fat stacks of cash. We literally just go, how do we make it better for people? Oh, let's include some random stickers with orders. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, let's do this. Let's try to get to them faster. Make sure it ships by noon. Yeah, let's do that. Let's hire more people. Let's do it. And so that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, one day, maybe I'll, you know, I'll forget to hire more people and make things better and we'll make some money. But for now, just keep making it to be an unbeatable behemoth where we got good products, good customer service, and fast shipping. Won't be cheap. That's the thing. I can't be cheap. I can be price competitive, but I cannot be cheap. That's the only thing. I had to give up on one thing, and I can't be the cheapest and all of those things. I can be like price competitive and all those things, but I can't beat a Walmart. You know, I can't, 
I can't do that and give you the aquarium co-op level of service. So we give up on that. Let's be real price competitive and do all the things right that we can. I'm setting up a 55 gallon tank and I'm watching this for jewel cichlids. That'll be a fun tank, especially when they got the cloud of babies going. Beautiful, beautiful fish. Um, I would keep those and show people, but then more people get them and then it's like a convict situ situation. Everyone's got convicts. What are we gonna do with all these convicts? Yeah, I don't know, but they're so pretty. By the way, pricing on products have gone down too. We, we lowered the price on aquarium co-op sponge filters and uh, a few other things too. So the reason I mentioned that, someone said, on the aquarium co-op sponge filters, I have a 20 gallon bow front. Uh, do I want a large or a medium, or would you recommend always upsizing? I, I pretty much run, I like to run these and everything. This is the uh, medium as we're calling it. This size right here. So the biggest one, the, and here's the reason why. Let me ugh, get in there. Quit making me look like I'm bad. They know I'm bad, but there we go. Phew. What I like about this, it's easy to fit in a fish bag and it's easy to clean. When you get the bigger you get, it's you gotta like, oh, get that fish bag on there. Oh man, I just jumped all the chocolate milk in my tank. So I like this size because it's wieldy. And so I would much rather run two of these than a big one. But sometimes people really got like, I got the perfect rock, piece, perfect piece of wood. I want the biggest sponge filter that fits behind that thing so I never see it. In that case, that makes sense. But for me, in my money, I like an army of this size right here, the medium. And it, you know, I've run 40 gallon tanks on just this and I really like it. You know, if I'm running, you know, if I run a 55, well, I can, I got 75, I run two of them, right? And uh, 125, I run three of them. So I just, I really, really do like the size. And, you know, if it was up to me, I would only sell this size. But I, I recognize like, well, some of you have nano tanks and, and no matter how much, you know, I try and convince you this is the best one. Some of you people drink Diet Pepsi and, uh, you know, you're going to want that bigger one because you can't be trusted. Diet Pepsi drinkers. I can't do it. Can't do it. Diet Coke. Diet Coke or nothing. Can I keep Neon Tetris on a five-gallon tank with guppies? Well, the answer is a technically yes. I would say please don't. Usually you're, it's going to be hard to balance the water between guppies wanting harder water than wanting softer water. And then also keeping water parameters up and good and only five gallons. Could definitely be done. I don't want to stop you from living your dream. If your dream is that, then do that. But if your dream is like an awesome tank, do something else. Or if your budget allows it, buy a 10 or a 20 gallon tank and then try it. What are the water parameters for blue diamond shrimp? I don't even know what a blue diamond shrimp is. And I, so for people that don't know me, that probably makes me sound like a noob, but a blue diamond shrimp is a cultivar variation, cultivar. That means someone wants to sell shrimp and so they named it a blue diamond shrimp. So I'm gonna Google it and then I'm gonna go, oh yeah, you mean that blue diamond shrimp are selectively bred from chocolate shrimp, which is basically just a slightly darker version of a blue velvet shrimp. So the question goes back to now that I'm informed on what we're trying to talk about, uh, water parameters for a blue diamond shrimp. Uh, I would say anywhere in the like seven pH to seven five, maybe down at six eight. Moderate hardness, moderate temperatures. You treat them like a cherry shrimp. They're they're fairly bulletproof. Just don't get bamboozled and get like blueberry shrimp where they've been dyed. Um, but yes, a blue diamond shrimp is just a darker version of blue velvet and usually when you look into a tank of blue velvets you're going to see the gamut of light blue to dark blue to almost black five tacos that cory doesn't see this you owe me five tacos how dare you how dare you think i wouldn't see tacos <laughs> i'm offended i'm setting up a high pan cistrus breeding tank for those of you who don't know that's a type of pleco i was wondering if, well, more than one type. I, my brain sometimes will stop me because it's like, no, 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 it's not just one type of pleco. It's a whole subspecies of plecos. You need to, so things like uh, Colombian zebra plecos and stuff like that and uh, uh, like the blue panak, not not blue panak. Um, I'm trying to think of more hypencistrus. King tigers, I think, are in there. 
Anyway, it's a subspecies of, of plecos. They typically get about three, four inches. So that's what he's talking about. Setting up high pancisterous breeding tank uh, because they like so much free swimming space. 75 gallon tank size in particular. Um, hold on. I mashed two together. That's a line above. So high pancisterous breeding tank. Wondering if they actually need crazy water flow, just like high oxygen water or just like the high oxygen content. Um, I've seen them breed both ways. Dean's having success. He's had success both ways. I think, honestly, it's just keeping them happy. Are they happier with water flow? Maybe. But when you increase water flow, you got to increase food. And if you increase food, you got to increase water changes. And if you're increasing water changes, maybe that was making them breed. Or maybe the more food was making them breed. Or maybe they actually did want the water. In general, I think it's a game of can you keep them super duper happy? If the answer is yes, you won the game, they'll make more probably. Now, if you need water to pull that off, that might be... Um, Oh man, make sure I'm not uh, make sure I'm not disclosing anything too crazy here. I gotta make sure it's on the camera. Candy is sending me her own troll. I don't. I think it came through to uh, our shipping or something like that. But look at that! It's Candy's head on an octopus, and it won't. Oh, get clear. The coffee mug even has a neon or a cardinal tetra. Nice touch. Nice touch, by the way. I like it. I like that. That's a good meme. Make it so. I, I've. What do you, do you christen a meme? How do you? I'm Corey McElroy, and I approve this meme. That's what I need to do. That's a that's a meme review right there. <clears throat> well, thank you, Joe. That made my that made my night. I like it. Uh, what would I wait? What would you recommend I do with an Endler popular popular? population that is growing a bit out of control. Well, don't put them with turtles, because that didn't work. I got way too many now. The turtles didn't off them like I thought they would. Uh, but mostly, try and give them to uh, friends, get them to start up a little pond, take them to your local fish store, if all of those are a failure. Uh, then maybe try feeding them to a turtle or a bigger fish, if you can find a friend with those or you have them. Do we ship food and merch to Germany? Uh, you can get like this shirt from Teespring on the link, boom, on the chat. But as far as actually shipping food and stuff, not yet. And I, I don't want to say yet like, oh man, he, he's, like next week it's happening. Like, no, no, no. I just hope someday we will. All right. I want to go back to that one that I read both lines because I realized the person was like, oh my gosh, he's reading my question. And then I totally bailed. So I want to try if I can find that uh, relatively quickly. By the way. I'm starting to overheat. Armpit check. Uh-oh. I'm going to have to turn the AC on. It's going to affect the sound quality a little bit. <clears throat> oh, man. I can't find that other one. <clears throat> I got to take a drink. Anyway, Nick Dew, welcome. And Chris Harrison, welcome. I apologize to the other person I can't find. Recently, Pogo Stolotis... Pogo stem and stellatus octopus from you guys, but they melt it completely to death. CO2 injection, lots of light, temperature at 75, dosing easy green. Any idea what went wrong? No. Uh, sometimes shipping can just like do a wallop on them. Sometimes it could be like, oh, your pH was liquid acid. That ain't going to work. And I'm not saying it is, right? Like what I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's probably something outside of the realm of like normal and so, you know, maybe is it your water parameters? Is it you had a crazy amount of flow? Is it uh, they got beat up, you know, got too hot or too cold in shipping? Um, what I would do, Thomas, is reach out to us if you haven't already. If you have, then, you know, I, we, you know we, I, don't, I shouldn't say hope. I know we took care of you if you have. Uh, but since it didn't make it, email us and we'll refund your money or ship you another one. Like, I prefer to refund money, but we always offer the reship. Um, just because it costs us ten dollars and eighty-seven cents to ship a plan, if that plan's only you know like we lose money, but uh, yeah, we 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 never want to leave someone hanging. Like if we sell you something and like a plant like that, it's like oh man, should have done well. And we're gonna ask some questions. By the way, we're gonna make sure it didn't need to dump it into like some battery acid. And you're like, what do didn't work, you know? But if we get through that and we're like, yeah, seems completely reasonable. Saw a picture of the tank. Mm, man, something went wrong with this. Let's make it right for this guy. And that's what we'll do. So 
Um, and that goes for anyone, like not just Thomas because he's a member, or not just because he mentioned something on the on the on the uh, the, uh, the live stream here. Like that's what we do. We take care of you guys. So yeah, we're not the cheapest, but when you come a knocking, we're not hiding from you either. It's not like you know we're not like looking through the window like have they left yet? Have they stopped asking for a refund yet? Shh, quiet down. Wait. Oh, he's coming back. You know, we're not hiding from. We just go, oh, man, something must have happened, you know, because the reality is we're shipping thousands and thousands and thousands of plants every week. And to not have 17 of them out of, you know, 4,000 plants have something happen to them in a week would be, you'd be insane to think that. Like, if I was like, our plants are perfect always. No, out of thousands, you're going to have a margin of error of like, you know, Ace Ventura delivery where it got thrown over the house, kicked and all that. And yeah, you're just going to be left with someone's like, oh, that thing failed to thrive. So yeah, we'll take Gary if we haven't already. And if we have, sorry about that. That's all I can do is give you the, oh man, I, I lose sleep at night going, how do we fix it? How do we make it so that that person doesn't have to experience that? In my opinion, what's a good CO2 system for a beginner? And will I ever start selling passive CO2 systems shown in the videos? Unlikely we're going to sell them online only because they have to ship differently. You can't ship to compress gases through the United States Postal Service. They have to go through UPS, which means we'd have to have a different whole trucking system land. Like we already have a semi truck come to our warehouse to pick up all the mail we ship. And we'd have to start breaking out shipments like, oh, you ordered this? Yeah, we got to ship it this way. And it's going to take two weeks to get there. By the way, I was price shopping our competitor and... The shipping on one of those things that I was just doing the research on, it wasn't going to land for 15 days. The estimated arrival was 15 days. And I just thought to myself, who would ever order knowing it takes 15 days? Like, we're in the year 2020. If it's not here by the time I'm done clicking the, the order button, it's already late. I could not, I mean, I guess I'm shocked because I just, maybe I don't have patience anymore. And it's not that, like, I order stuff all the time and it takes a while to get here, right? But in general, I'm just shocked that, like, their whole business runs on 15-day shipping, huh? Like, we can't because of the plants. It's not even an option for us. Like, the plants have to go quick. They, they're going to freeze to death. They're going to overheat. But I am shocked when I see that kind of stuff. Like, whew, that lead time is brutal. Brutal. And I always think, by the way, like, that allows you to be really lax in a warehouse. So it's like, oh, 14-day lead time? Hey, I'll get to shipping that, like, mm, give me a couple days. Whereas, like, we're shipping so fast that, so I, I do know this, and I, I can't show you because I don't have it set up, but uh, over the course of the month, our average ship time from the time someone places an order to the time we print a shipping label is 14 hours. In the last week, because we hired some help a couple weeks ago, in the last week, the average time is 11 hours. And that even includes the Sunday, which we can't ship. So that actually skews our results. But in general, over all the orders we do, 11 hours in the last week from the minute you guys place it, the average time till a label's printed and ready to go. I just think that's really good. Like, and I'm So now that we have that metric, I'm like, I'm going to get that down to like, I don't know how low it can go because if you're placing orders at 3 o'clock in the morning, like we don't start packing until 8 a.m. So there's always going to be like a, probably the minimum has probably got to be like, well, it's all an average, right? So if you guys order at 11 a.m. and we ship by noon, that's only a one hour, and that one's a 13 hour. So we could, I want to get it down to like six hours. You know, we'll be, we'll be doing some magic. All right, I got you an AC on. I am dying. I'm dying. Coco go, go Gadget 75 AC is what I got to turn to you. By the way, look how good this shirt looks. All right. I want two octopus plants, but I don't want to pay for shipping. Me too. I want $2 million, but I don't want to work. Funny how those go hand in hand, right? By the way, at the moment, I think on the website, it's $5 shipping. So like this is a good, this is a good corner case. So if you buy two octopus plants from us, we charge $9.99, that's 20 bucks. And then we have $5 shipping. So it's 25 bucks total we're going to take in. It's going to cost us 10 to $11 ship it, right? 
And then in general, we got to pay for all the employees and everything. And I know what that cost is. So that's like another six bucks. So we're about 16, 17 bucks. And then we have the transaction fees, which what's two, two-ish percent of, you know, it's going to be what? Yeah, 20 cents, 60 cents. So we're at like 18 bucks. So we'll make about $6. So yes, at that we make about $6. So long as you never ask a question or anything, we would come out profitable on that. But in general, if one of those plants went bad or they got lost or anything like that, we wouldn't make any money. And uh, so yeah, that's unfortunately like, that's how things get priced, right? Like, oh, I could see how there's at $6, like if you run a business, you know, like, on a $25 order, there's only $6 there. Like anything gets tied up, you're losing money. And we're, you know, we're cutting it down as much as we can. And, uh, well, wait, I didn't even factor in the price of the, the plants yet. I, well, I can't tell you how much they cost, but I'll say this. There's not a lot of, not a lot of meat left on the bone after that transaction. Cause, um, yeah, that doesn't even, doesn't even have the cost of the plants in there yet. Ugh. Oh. Oh, that's why we we like it when you guys order a lot. We love it when you order a lot. Okie dokie. Um, <laughs> Dana or Dana? Dana. It must be Dana Burke. I'm that person that can't sleep and uh, sees what the co-op has in stock. Yeah. I mean, I order a lot of... I order a lot of stuff late at night because I get done with work and then it's like, I almost need like retail therapy to unwind. Like, ah, what do I need? Yes, I need that shirt or something. I don't know. All right. I've got a 90 gallon tank for my four green spotted puffers. Do you think that size is decent? Mine aren't aggressive. I think, I, you're, yeah. I mean, if you hit that six inch mark, it might feel a little cramped, but I think you got a solid start on that for sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't be too worried, but I would definitely, you know, keep an eye on it. I would love to get your opinion on deep sand bed tanks to reduce water usage. Um I I don't well I don't believe that deep sand bed tanks reduce water usage any more than plants do. So, I mean, I've been I've had long debates with people, but my, my question is usually like, why are you picking like the hardest way to accomplish the thing that plants do? And then usually they're like, well, because, uh, you know, people say that deep sand beds are the way to do it. And I'm like, well, what do people, what do plants do? Well, yeah, you know, they, I mean, I mean, they remove toxins and, and, and nitrates and, and heavy metals and, uh, you know, everything too. And I'm like, then why not just use plants? Well, yeah, yeah, because yeah, there's, there's a, you know, like a video that was on deep sand beds and, you know, I, I have dirt and sand and, and yeah. And then I'm like, well, what about if a fish ever digs or you accidentally gravel back and you lose everything? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I just, just something I was thinking about. You know, like I have that conversation so often and my response is just plants are nature's filter. And I'm not saying a deep sand bed can't do that, but a deep sand bed makes way more sense in a saltwater tank or in a tank you can't have plants, right? But in a tank you can't have plants, usually what is that? Oh, fish that dig, cichlids, things like that. And then you're like, well, then you can't do a deep sand bed either. But you could be like, oh, I put a deep sand bed in the sump, and then I did it. Like, you can get into these technical scenarios, and there is always corner cases in which any crazy idea is the best idea. Because, like, well, you paint me into that box, yes, that is the best idea. But most times when I'm talking to people, they're like, well, you know, I got, like, 26 aquariums. You know, I got plants. I got things. I'm doing stuffs. And this is just the thing I haven't done yet. In which case, my answer is, yeah, then do it. Experiment. Play with it. I mean, if you're asking, should I have fun and, and challenge the system and see what things are doing, by all means, yes. That's how I learn. But, you know, a lot of times people go, I just want what's best for my fish. And then I go, well, you know, that they're going to want something that you can take care of easily. They want terrain like, you know, plants and that kind of stuff. Do that. Um, but yes, you can get there with a deep sand bed as well. It just, it doesn't look as good when you got a big old chunky substrate and you're like, oh, what's that like layer of, uh, you know, denitrifying bacteria down there that's anaerobic and what's going on there? Yeah. You know, I, I observe it in nature and it's, it's a thing for sure. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure it has a great place in an aquarium and it's not, I really want to be clear here. You can totally do it. There are people that do it. I just don't see the super value in doing it in your average home aquarium. 
outside of science experiment. And like, oh man, your grade 11 science experiment for, you know, for graduation project, do it. Yes, that, that's a reason to do it. But if it's just like, is this going to be easier than maintaining a tank normally? No, if it was, we'd all be doing it. Like, and I think that's part of what goes on is people are like, I done stumbled upon some. Everyone else is a fool. Why aren't they doing this thing? You do the research, and even the studies say it does all the things. And it's like, well, yeah, it's like diet and exercise. If everyone just diet and exercised, we wouldn't be fat. There, it's not a secret. It's just too much work. Kind of the same thing. Like, yes, this deep sand bed is perfect in a vacuum where it never gets disturbed. And, you know, it is kind of perfect. But in a real life situation, you're like, oh, it took eight months to set up. Oh, I move every two years because I live in an apartment. And so therefore it's like always a thing. And I can't really, you know, I can't sell my dirt. I can't sell, I, I can sell my plants. I can't change the way my dirt looks, you know, and dirt is a, not the right word here. Substrate, like it, you can do it with dirt and nature does it with dirt, but you wouldn't do that in an aquarium. So I don't want someone to run out there and be like, I put in four inches of miracle girl. Like you said, like, no, 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 that's, that's not what I meant. Uh, but yes, yeah, so deep sand beds, could they reduce water changes? Yes. Uh, but I, I, I truly believe that plants are just a better way to do this. So that's, that's where I would go with this because, and I, I should, I should follow this up on why I believe that when you do trim plants, you're actually removing stuff from a system. I believe that a deep sand bed will remove a lot and they will strip down a lot and will break down a lot of things. But in general, things aren't finding a way to leave that system. Like, yes, gases will escape, but there are things like, you know, let's say you're building up on calcium from a food you feed. In general, they're not really leaving with a deep sand bed. But with a plant, it actually consumes it, makes cellular structure, you trim it, it goes and leaves the system, right? So I, I do put more faith in plants technically than I do a deep sand bed, but both can get you where you need to go if you really want to go that way. All right. King Lee's in the chat? Good. That's all I got to say about that is good. Hope you're healthy, King. Hope your family's doing well. Uh, yeah. You got, a, you got a tornado of little girls that... Uh, you know, and when I ask if you're doing good, it's like you still got your sanity because, whew, it's a tornado of little girls and guppies at King Lee's. I'll tell you what. I was looking at your Eheim 100 review of air pumps. Do you still, still think it's good? I didn't see them online. Am I still selling them? No, because Eheim kind of pulled out of the American market. And long term, in long term use, usually you'd get it so that one of the valves would get stronger than the other. Even if you try to adjust them, they, it wasn't like a perfect thing. It was still pretty good though. As far as air pumps go, it was decent. Uh, now, I think Awaze just built the same same uh, air pump and made it more expensive. I don't even know what price they are. I just, I just like to throw shade at Awaze because I just think they're not not a great company. But uh, you know, when you look at it, if you look at the Eheim one and theirs, and you're like, oh yeah? What's different? What's different? Kind of like, I don't know where it is, I do love to troll them, but kind of like their uh, their Meg float or whatever they have. It's not a Meg float, but it, I can't remember what the exact thing was, but it says like Oase on it, but then like stamped in the plastic says like Aquion or like some other brand. It's like, oh yeah, this is you. It says right here, it's not you. <laughs> but, and there's nothing wrong with the rebranding. I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest rebrander there is. Like, you know, this isn't, this isn't proprietary. This is airline tubings. But my trick is try and make it cheaper and slightly better instead of maximizing all profit with... Now I got to look. I got to see what the Waze air pumps cost because now I'm throwing shade and I got to make sure it's even... Because it could be $4 and then I'm just looking like an idiot. Uh, Waze air pump. How much does this thing cost? No, those are like... Hmm. I need like the home version was it air pumps for sale at Home Depot? That's pond. I'm looking. I'm looking to see. Hmm. Oh, wait, right. Here's one. I'm... Here we go. On eBay. There you go. eBay is a good. So the one hundo, the 100, 
$31.74. What's an Eheim 100 air pump cost? Eheim 100 air pump. Uh, doo -doo -doo. On saltwater.com, $33.99. All right. Ooh, when you, when you Google Eheim 100 air pump, there's my video. <laughs> yeah. So do I think it's a good air pump? It's, it's a pretty good air pump. Like it's honestly, it's kind of hard to make a bad air pump. It's kind of a commodity type item. Uh, you're looking at longevities and warranties and uh, that kind of stuff that really, I feel like, I mean, obviously the sound and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's a decent air pump. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you to not buy one um, unless you knew a specific feature like, oh, I want the quietest. Like these, super quiet, runs my 800 gallon. You know, or I gotta run a whole fish room, linear air piston pump, or oh, I gotta run, I wanna run like a bunch of air drops to just one 300 gallon tank. I'd be like, oh, get one of those four way ones from like uh, Petco. Like that's 30 bucks, right? Four way, works for like a couple years, burns out, but still pretty decent value, I feel. All right. How do you keep aquarium plants alive easily? Oh, I'm glad you asked. With this, which is easy green. That was bad product placement. Yes, easy green. No, but really, they need good light. That's a good thing, you know. Uh, make sure you got a good aquarium plant growing light. And then make sure you give them food. It doesn't have to be our food, you know, but they do need good food. And not all food is good, by the way. So just because you're like, I own a fertilizer, you kind of got to do a little bit of research and go, well, what is a good fertilizer? And like, obviously I sell this, so I'm going to say it's good, but do some research and see if other people, like 1,700 people or something like that, think this is good also, you know, and I paid every one of them $20 to say that. So, you know, it took me a while. It's not true, but, you know, get yourself some food for the plants and get yourself some light. And that's what makes most of the magic happen. And then the big third thing, when you're new, make sure you're getting aquatic plants. A lot of times you roll into a box store, you pick up an army of plants, you get home and they all die. And then you research three weeks later, and you're like, wait a second, that Mondo grass ain't meant for my aquarium. Wait a second, that bamboo needed to be up out of the water. It can be down with the roots, but the top can't be. Wait a second, you keep hitting all these like, oh, the aluminum plant didn't work either. This is crap. So, you know, get those elements under control and then it pretty much grows. And the reason why Easy Green does well for people is because we've taken, we took that element out. It's kind of like, oh, could I just buy one, one really good TV dinner that always tastes good and is super healthy for me? Yeah, that's Easy Green, right? And then you'd be like, well, I'm a classically trained chef and I can make the best meals in all the world and I make my own fertilizer. Cool. I can't cook. So if you make something that's really tasty and I can throw in the microwave and it's healthy for me, I'm gonna buy that. And that's what Easy Green is. Easy Green is that convenience factor, all in one, boom, don't have to think about it, there you go. I was able to get my zebra plecos to breed for me. Congratulations. Wow, that's a good thing, King. I got three little pleco babies I need to keep alive. What's the best food for baby zebra plecos? I would ask Dean, but in general, I would think like uh, chopped up live black worms, frozen blood worms. Uh, I'd get some rapashi in there, uh, but they'll eat on flake and everything. I think the big thing is realize they're a scavenger. And a lot of times we're like, but they're zebras, they're worth so much. Yeah, but what would you raise bristle nose with? Oh, like wafers and just food and stuff. Like, yeah, do that. Like they're they're worth more, but not crazy different in terms of raising them. They're harder to breed, but that doesn't mean they're harder to raise. And so, you know, a lot of food, a lot of water changes. And a lot of times what I'll say is, what were you raising the parents on? If you mash that up better, you know, so it can fit in a little pleco's mouth, that would be fine. You know, they're not too picky. Remember, in the wild, they got to scavenge. So just make sure they got lots of stuff to scavenge on. Keep a little piece of wood in there. Not that they're big wood eaters, but... They can eat biofilm if they want to, if they're really desperate, you know, keep some food around for them. All right. Need easy green in India? I know. That's one day I hope to hire someone that can really spearhead how do we get our products into more countries. It's It takes so much bandwidth to like even understand like, what would it take? What are the laws? What what certifications do we need? What business licenses? What distribution? What, you know, it takes someone that really wants to go, yeah, I'm gonna spend two years and crack this egg. 
And right now, I just don't want to be like, yeah, I'll see you guys in two years. I won't be on YouTube. I won't be traveling. I won't do any of that because I got to I gotta figure this out. And so, yeah, that's, that's why it's not out there yet. It's like, oof, I just don't have the bandwidth to pull this off right now. And that's... That's why we, we can, like, I really wanted to partner with, like, Dennerlay or someone where they already have worldwide distribution because it's a lot easier to go, hey, let's just get Easy Green on that train, too. You know, but these partnerships have never worked out yet. So, I mean, I'm a hard guy to work with. I demand perfection. Most businesses will not run at the level Aquarium Co-op will run. And it's, it, half of them, it's can't. They want to, but they can't. Like, they, they're not willing to invest in the infrastructure. They're not willing to meet deadlines and all that kind of stuff. And the other ones are just like, no, that costs too much money to run like that. That's not efficient. And I I go on the, well, I'm not willing to compromise. So if it's not perfect, if we're not striving for the perfect customer experience, you know, a lot of people are like, well, our competitors do this. And I go, yeah, that's why you're not beating them because you're doing the same thing they are. You got to do better than them. How do you do better? Ask yourself that. And that's why I'm always giving companies these ideas, you know, whether it's whether it's Extreme, Dennerlay, Oase. I come to them, I go, hey, here's how you do your thing better. Mm, no. Okay, then. That's fine. You know, I'll, I'll go do it myself. And then they get all, they get mad. They go, hey, you're doing the thing. I know, I told you guys to do that. You wouldn't do it. And then, you know, then it, you just part ways. Like, oh, yeah, that's true, you know. Okay. All right. How long can an Anubius plant I got from you handle being in the cup? Oh, in a cup. Because I was like, we don't ship in a cup. Not sure how long I can... Oh, wait. How long until I can get substrate and don't want to mess up my first plant? Uh, a long time. You can just float that in your aquarium. If you float Anubius, they kind of just, like, grow into a ball. And then eventually you could, like, pluck off a couple leaves and make... This is the bottom. But that's a good plant to be your first one because, you know, as long as it's wet, and it doesn't even have to be underwater. As long as it's wet, it'll be all right. Any any light at all, you know, turn your cell phone on, give it a couple couple minutes of light, it'll be all right. Every day, by the way, every day. All right. Ooh, I gotta I gotta find the next one. Mm hmm. My water temp in my outdoor tub is eighty. You're in the sweet spot, Levi. Put stuff outside. Enjoy it, my friend. Mine aren't that warm yet. It was wicked cold and rainy two days ago. Now it's super hot, overheating in my U-Haul. And we're, we're doing this at the moment. Whoa. Like, I want that. Oh, yeah. Time to play outside mode. But we're not quite there here. So enjoy it while you got it. I'm jelly. Barbara Brunson, welcome to the team. My wife asked me if I would like pierogies or if I'd like burgers for dinner. If I'm given that choice, the last time we made pierogies, they were so good, I will choose that with the meat and everything that you put in last time. That was really good. So if you make those ones, those. But my wife always does. What do you want for dinner? And then I always follow with whatever you'll make me because you're the one that's cooking and I'm the one that doesn't cook for myself. So I always follow up with if you'd rather do something else, I realize she's cooking for me and therefore, I will defer to you. But if I get the choice, I'm choosing those pierogies with some meat in them. Mm -mm. Real good. Smallest goldfish breed? Technically, that'd be the Siamese doll, which is either a real thing or a complete myth. I don't know that answer. Because I've never seen them in person. People swear they're real. So I can't, I can't, I've seen them on wholesale lists. They've never shipped them to me. I don't know if they're just stunted goldfish or not. Um, but those are the smallest ones. After that, it'd probably be the, uh, the ping pong goldfish or the, um, pearl, is it pearl scale? Yeah, pearl scale. Would I recommend keeping mystery snail, wait, what would you recommend to keep mystery snail eggs in if you don't have enough humidity in the aquarium? Wet paper towels and a piece of Tupperware with either the lid slightly cracked open or a couple of pinholes to allow some oxygen exchange. That's what I would do. Five dollars from Fish Room Fever. Thank you. By the way, last time I was live, I was wearing a shirt that said Corridor Love, and I said it was Friday Fish Facts, and that is wrong. 
And someone was like, oh, man, Fish for Thought almost got a shout out. And I feel bad because I like Fish for Thought because he's doing his own type of content, and that's rare. Most of us, we just do the same stuff as other people. He's doing his own thing, and I, I admire that. So, uh, Fish for Thought. I like your style. I don't watch a lot of your videos because I don't watch a lot of fish videos at all because I live, eat, and breathe fish. But I like your style. I laugh at your funny little raps. I like that you're putting yourself out there and you deserve anything you got coming in towards you because you put yourself out there. So hopefully you guys check him out. He's a funny dude. And uh, I really do think he's enjoying his aquariums and what he's doing. And that, that means so much more than a lot of other stuff, honestly. If you see someone really enjoying what they're doing, it's hard not to fall in love with that. Hey, I took your advice. Uh-oh. And I overfed the Corydora paleatus and had a small batch of fry last week. Only seven of them so far, but they look ready to go again, so thank you. You probably just forgot to put sour cream on the tacos. You know, if you only fed them tacos and there wasn't enough sour cream, you don't get that many Corydora fry. Yeah. We have to watch. If I eat too much sour cream, we have little Corys running around here. So, you know, we're on a strict don't cross the sour cream threshold. Otherwise, I start cloning myself. I'm like a I'm like a Markreb crayfish. What's the best thing I could give my blood parrot? Tumor. Oof. Uh, lots of clean water in a stress-free environment. So maybe his own tank. Keep the water level or the water temps down a little bit. High-quality food. You know, get yourself like a, some like Vitacam or something. Soak his food in it. A lot of amino acids. A lot of those vitamins in there low stress environment and a lot of times you'll see the tumors recede over a few months but that's not a guarantee you know i would say like 50 percent of the time you're like dang that thing went away awesome and then half the time you're like nothing i can do is going to save this well not save because it's not dying but nothing's going to reverse what's going on all right flynn asking if there's an inappropriate amount of sour cream or salsa you're canadian you don't even know what those are one time I watched him eat ketchup and he said it was too spicy. It's not true, but it could be true with Flynn. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, do you know, wait, do you know any fish like a knife fish, but is not? Okay, black, flattish face, long barbs, wavy back like a knife fish. Bought three of them, forgot the name. They're super cool. Okay, let me think. It's got to be black, flattish face, flattish face. What does that mean? Like this, maybe? Long barbs, like barbels, or maybe barbs, wavy back. So I'm guessing that's like the knife. Bought three of them, though. So it can't be, like an Abba Abba knife has the knife on the top, and they're real expensive. I can't imagine you'd buy three of them. Hmm, what could be like that? And it's got to be black. Long barbs, flattish face. I, I don't know. That one's, that one's throwing me for a loop. Hopefully someone else in here is like, oh, you dummy, that's a blah blah blah. Like, oh, yeah, you know, what you gonna do? All right. Uh, so if I understand correctly, would protein pellets help with spawn number? Sometimes it's protein, but it could be fats. So a lot of times to develop uh, eggs, you need a lot of fat in there. And so it might be, you know, if you're running real high protein but low fat, and that's where things like uh, live black worms and blood worms, they're higher in fats typically. Uh, so you could try that. But in general, lots of food, lots of conditioning ends up being more babies. So I think you're on the right track. I wouldn't change anything too radical because right now it's like you went from doing nothing to, ooh, they're, they're working. And then... Like, we don't want to change it. Be like, they're doing nothing again. Like, just do more of what you're doing. And over time, like, nutrition's a thing over time, right? So they got a little bit healthier. But in a month, they might be way healthy. And they're just, pff, there's 4,000 babies. All right. Do I like uber hot peppers? No. No. Uh, I'm like a one-star, two-star kind of guy. I, I need that on a shirt. <laughs> Every time I go out to eat... It should, I should just be like, it says one or two star, you pick. Any more than that, like every once in a while I'll do three stars on curry, but it can get a little like, woo, yeah. Didn't, didn't realize this one, you know, didn't think this meal was going to be an experience. Uh, sometimes I like to taste my food instead of experiencing my food. African dwarf fish breeding? 
African dwarf fish, like Afri like like dwarf cichlids. They're mostly mouth brooders, uh, fairly easy. Just kind of need males and females and a little bit of time. Ooh, we got four minutes. I gotta start thinking of the word of the day for John's live streaming. What is the worm of the worm worm of the day? Yes, worm of the day. Hashtag worm of the day. We're going with worm of the day. My brain, it's got worms. Any tips on moving shrimp tanks? If they're small ones, I like to drain them down. Get them real low on that water where they got a little bit of water. You got your substrate. And then I cover the top with some saran wrap. And then I either bear hug this thing or I just pick it up or I get a friend. Sometimes that's hard. You got to go find a friend. That's usually the least useful option for me. So I end up bear hugging. Uh, and I just kind of set it in the back of a car and I drive it to the new place. If it's just... If you're not even moving that far, you just pick it up and go put it in the other part of the room you're putting it at. All right. So, yes, worm of the day, hashtag worm of the day. Is duckweed a big mistake? I think everyone needs to experience duckweed. I've got it in a couple of my ponds, and I love it. And then I've got it in a couple of my tanks, and I hate it. So is it a mistake? Mm, I don't know. You know, you definitely get people that are... Uh, you know, they tend to be fanatical, like, oh, it's going to kill you. Oh, I love it. It's somewhere in the middle. It's super useful sometimes, and then sometimes you hate it. But I, you know, if I could if I could wave a wand, I'd probably say, like, okay, maybe I won't have it. But, and then you, you would, like, get a different species of fish. I'm like, I need the cover. All right, I want it back. Bring it back. Um, let's see. Are, are you or any friends using easy fry food for shrimp? I mean, I definitely put them in shrimp tanks, but it's not like specifically like I don't because I always keep fish and shrimp together. So I'm not like specifically going, oh, here's extra for the shrimp. It's just like here's a bunch of food. But I put other stuff in there, too. And so I don't want to lead you astray and be like, yes, I run 27 shrimp tanks and they only get the easy fry food because I make the monies from it. No, but they, they definitely get some. But I, I don't know that I could. Uh, um you know, say like, oh yes, it leads to that ninth ninth leg on the shrimp real good. Where did I get the name uh, Aquarium Co-op from? I got it from my nightmares. Hindsight being 2020, never name yourself the Aquarium Co-op. It's a bad idea because people will think you're a daycare and that sucks. But the original thought was, how do we, we source things locally? We care about the environment. We want educated employees. We want to carry products that are highly tailored. And I loved to go to the co-op grocery store because they had homemade products. They had local things. They had tailored things. The people that worked there were passionate about the foods and the soaps and everything they were selling. I was like, yes, let's bring this culture into the aquarium hobby where we care and we want to see you succeed. And we've done that. It turns out, though, that an aquarium co-op is too often mistake, mistaken for a preschool. And uh, they changed the law so that we are technically not a, a legal co-op. But because we became the aquarium co-op before they ever changed the law, we're okay. But that doesn't stop people from going, hey, you can't be a co-op. It says right here in this law that was established three years after you were an aquarium co-op that you can't do that. And then I go, yes, we looked into that. And the answer comes back that... Yes, we can do that. And we file every year as Aquarium Co-op with uh, both the corporation taxes and our state license. And they never say anything because they see, oh, here you were established in 2012. So that is the story of Aquarium Co-op. Do I know anything about dollar sunfish? No. Uh, I just know that a lot of sunfish look cool, like the long-eared ones and stuff like that. But I don't have any locally, or at least I've never seen any locally. And, uh, so yeah, I don't know a whole lot about them other than they look cool. We got, oh, it's like now, now time, now time. We're going over to the KG Tropicals live stream and we're going to hashtag worm of the day. Worm of the day. Now I'm going to go over there and hang out a little bit and then I'm going to dive into analytics and be working. So don't think that I'm not listening because I'm a listening, but I'm not typing a whole lot because John and Lisa, if I type something, a lot of times... It'll distract them, and I know what that's like. And when you get distracted, then you get worms in the brain, and then you end up making the word of the day worm of the day. So let's head on over there and show them love and, uh, you know, wind down the rest of your night, listen to some fish nerds do their fish nerdery 
while I'll make sure that uh, we work towards getting your packages out even faster. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out. I hope to be live next week. I don't know yet. We'll see how the shipping schedule shakes out. And uh, hope for it either not being super hot next week so I don't have to sweat in the U-Haul or I find a better solution to get it fixed or whatever is going to happen there because sweaty guy picking up plants, not a good look. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks for all the stickers. Thanks for all the new members. Buy yourself a shirt if you want one. If you don't want one, I understand. I understand. And uh, worm of the day, I'll see you over there.